Well, good morning, everyone. It is so good to see you here on this beautiful Monday morning. This is the beginning of Creation Care Week, and uh, we're excited to engage in that within chapel, within the uh, things that are happening around our community here on campus. And so it is good to be here. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and, if you're making your way in, uh, just go ahead and take a seat and uh, let's pause for a moment as we get ready to engage into a time of worship. Today we're going to be hearing from Callie Markle, and she's a a PLNU alum, and she'll be sharing uh, her story with us and the ways in which she has engaged uh, in creation, and um, it'll be a a great time for us to uh, be able to open our hearts and to have listening ears to hear what she has to say uh, for us. And so um, as we get ready to prepare our hearts for a time of worship, uh, will you just go ahead and, and bow your heads and quiet your hearts as Melanie leads us in a time of prayer. God, we give you our time this morning to meet as a congregation, a congregation that is a beautifully complex image of you. In the midst of a busy day, would you interrupt us with peace, intervene on our conversations, hold our faces up to you. We thank you for this time to pause and to take a deep breath and acknowledge the message you have for us. We give you our praise in this time of worship. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from Romans 8, 19 through 23. The whole creation waits breathless with anticipation for the revelation of God's sons and daughters. Creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice. It was the choice of the one who subjected it. But in the hope that the creation itself will be free, will be set free from slavery to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of God's children. We know that the whole creation is groaning together and suffering labor pains up until now. And it's not only the creation. We ourselves who have the spirit as the first crop of the harvest also groan inside as we wait to be adopted and for our bodies to be set free. The word of the Lord. Well, welcome. Um, We have with us this morning uh, a good friend and alumni of PLNU, Callie Markle. Uh, Callie studied uh, writing and theology while she was here. And did you graduate in 03? 2003 grad. Um, And we wanted Callie to share of um, her own experience and her own love uh, of creation, uh, kind of her vocation as a writer and how that passion for creation has spilled into her writing and um, also some of her own pretty profound experiences uh, with creation. I've got a little remote here. Uh, Callie has been featured in National Parks Magazine. Uh, several of her articles have been uh, cover cover stories for National Parks Magazine. So it's a real treat to have you with us, Callie. Thank Thanks it's for being here. To be here. open this noisy water bottle. Uh, I just want to start this morning by um, asking you to describe a bit of the context of your childhood, like kind of the land. Paint us a picture for the kind of place you grew up in. Sure. Um, I was born and raised in Redding, California. Really? Yeah? (laughs) There's one. Um, It's at the north far northern end of California. So when people say Northern California, they usually mean the Bay Area. So we say far Northern California. (laughs) Um, So the region I grew up in, uh, the Shasta region, is about 20% of the space of California, but only one eighth of the population. So there's a lot of land and not a lot of people. And it's beautiful. There are, uh, it's like a horseshoe of two mountain ranges that come together. Um, So there's mountains on three sides. Um, There are multiple lakes. Uh, The Sacramento River comes out of the ground in Mount Shasta and flows all the way down uh, through my city. And um, 
There's a lot of hiking trails, waterfalls, volcanoes, glaciers, caves, pretty much everything except desert. Well, no, there's high desert too. Um, yeah, there's pretty much everything you could ever want. It's just gorgeous. And so as a child, spend a lot of time out in nature? Yeah. yeah. So cause I grew up on, I think, one to two acres. Everyone around me had one to two acres. The neighbor had horses. Um, we spent every Saturday on the lake. Um, and you could always just find a trail to walk on, um, go play in the river. And, um, yeah, we were just always outside. Mm. When you came to college, this is not a rural part of the state, <laughs> Uh, what was that transition like coming from these wide open rural spaces in northern northern California to San Diego? Um, I struggled the first year because I had not yet learned to see fall and winter. So if this is your first year, just it's going to be hard. <laughs> um, um, I'm used to having four distinct beautiful seasons. Um, but I mean, Point Loma is a beautiful campus and there's an ocean. So it's sort of it's sort of made up for the lack of natural beauty around me. Um, but it, you know that John Muir quote, the mountains are calling and I must go. Like that's always in, that's always in me. Mm. So, what, um, what role did the ocean play in kind of your relationship to nature during your years here? Um, it took the place of the woods that I grew up with. Um, so, you know, bad day, you go to the cliffs or the beach and you kind of um, reground yourself in the natural world and um, reset yourself um, and get your perspective on things. Mm. So it, it was a small substitute, <laughs> yeah. but um, so you were still drawn there. Mm -hmm. So now you're living uh, back in Reading. Yes. Um, what was the journey like? Um, from San Diego back to Reading. Why did you move back? Yeah, tell us about that journey. Um, so when my husband and I graduated, um, you know, we were 22 and wanted to live in a cool, hip city, um, but we couldn't afford to. <laughs> um, but we we thought we wanted city life, and so we tried that out in the Sacramento area and um, lived in a suburb outside of Sacramento and. Um, it was not a good fit. Uh, it was, there was one point where I was on an overpass and I looked out and A, there's, there's no mountains in the distance. Um, so the land just goes. And I have sort of a reverse claustrophobia where if like, if there's no mountains in the distance, I feel really creeped out and like lost in space. Um, but I looked out and there were just roof lines of the same shape and size of house for like as far as the eye could see. And I was like, we got to get out of here. <laughs> and it, you know, that works for some people, but it didn't work for us. Um, and we still had friends and family in the Reading area. And so we decided to move back there. So when you moved back to Reading, um, you guys got some land. Tell us a little bit about uh, the place that you have there, kind of the why of that. Yeah. Um, so by then we had two kids and we found this place for sale. It was on an acre, um, and it had a pond and some fruit trees. It was on the slope and the house was built sort of into the slope and it had these big windows, um, where you could look out. So it felt like you were in a tree house, um, and who doesn't want to live in a tree house? Um, and then there were woods around our house that were um, private property but uninhabited. So our house backed up to woods and our neighbors had land on either side. Um, so it was, uh, it was just kind of paradise. Um, the, so out of the, out of the woods would come um, deer. Uh, there was a bear that would come and eat the pears off our pear tree. Um, there were coyotes and foxes. Um, we had a, our pond was really little. It was only about the size of this little stage. Um, but there was like a, a pair of ducks that kind of adopted our pond. Um, there was an egret that would come to our pond. Um, there were quail everywhere. If you've never lived with quail, they're the most adorable, nutty little birds. Like you would open your door and just hear like a crazy noise because like a thousand quail would go by and they're little like hairdos. Um, <laughs> I miss the quail. Uh, we had chickens, and it was it was 
I don't know how to describe it without sounding cliche, but it was idyllic to just look out my window and see animals just living their lives um, on property that I was living on. Um, you know, often we think about like our homes uh, or if you grew up on an acre, uh, you know, as our property. It, but when I hear you talk about uh, the land that you guys have in Redding, uh, it feels more nuanced than just like property that I own. Oh, yeah. So uh, how, how do you think of your relationship with that acre and that property? I think that I was just borrowing it. Like I was a guest there. I definitely, um, I love it with every fiber of my being while at the same time um, was completely humbled by it. Um, Cause when we first moved in, the neighbors are like, you're gonna have to keep fixing your fence cause the bear is gonna keep busting down your fence. Um, and I was like, sweet, like there's no bear that comes to this piece of land that I am also on. I am sharing space with a wild bear. Um, and it was fine because he only ever came at like two in the morning or she. Um, but um, it was, uh, I felt honored to share the space with the animals that they would feel comfortable using the land because I knew, you know, it's, it's the animal's land before it's our land. Like we are, new here, we are guests here. Um, so there was an intense piece about that, that I could I could share this space. And it wasn't like we landscaped, it was still kind of wild. And um, yeah, it was just, anytime I had a bad day, I could come home and there would be animals living peacefully around me. You know, that it, can't, it can't be overstated to live in, in harmony and again, I know that's kind of a cheesy word, but um, but it is what it is. It was good for your soul. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you may have picked up we're using a lot of past <laughs> tense uh, in talking about Callie's land. Two summers ago, uh, the car fire devastated so much of the Reading area. Uh, tell us about your experience, what it was like to live through the car fire. So, um, quick context, um, it's car with two R's, like fires are named for basically their point of origin. So this one um, started near uh, a historical point named after a family, so it was the car powerhouse. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a car fire, I'm not talking about a, a car fire. Um, so we lit uh, the property we were on, and one of the reasons we chose it was that it was about five miles from a national recreation area, or a national park, um, which was, um, called Whiskey Town National Recreation Area. Um, and it was 42,000 acres of woods and lake and waterfalls and trails. Um, so two Julys ago, um, a car traveling through there uh, blew a tire and before they could safely get over to the shoulder threw a bunch of sparks, started some brush fires that would become the car fire. Um, we thought it was gonna like be a fire in the woods um, and that it would get taken care of, um, but uh, the wind had other plans. And um, so after a few days of them kind of keeping it relatively small, um, it was at 6,000 acres. Um, the Point Loma campus is 90 acres. So the fire was still manageable at 6,000 acres, um, but overnight the wind shifted and blew it into Redding and it went from 6,000 to 20,000 acres overnight. So we had to evacuate our house at about six in the morning um, and went to stay with friends on the other side of town um, that day, so that was a Thursday. Um, over the course of that day, the wind got nuttier um, and crazier and at one point um, the because wildfires create their own wind and they, they create their own weather system. Uh, it created a fire tornado, um, an actual like seven, I think they, s they estimated it like 17,000 foot high fire tornado. Um, and it jumped the Sacramento River and pushed into Redding proper. Um, and that's also when um, some first responders lost their lives. 
And then, so we woke up the next morning, um, and you know, you're just checking every possible news source. Um, and we found out via a Facebook Live broadcast uh, that our entire neighborhood had been destroyed. Um, it also destroyed, so like I said, the, the national park we live by was 42,000 acres. It also burned 39,000 of those 42,000 acres, um, which was a, uh, a significant loss because um, people don't live in Reading because it's convenient um, or that it's like got all the amenities of a big city. You live in somewhere like Reading because you are deeply connected to that land and what that land looks like and what that land offers. Um, so for us not only to lose our neighborhood, but to lose our lakes and rivers um, and trails and mountains, um, it was deeply devastating for a lot of people. Um, it's been over a year and some of the trails still aren't open. And um, the only thing I can really compare it to is, um, like, if you came to Point Loma because and you did a bunch of inconvenient things to be at this campus because you wanted to be by the ocean, um, and then you woke up tomorrow morning and the ocean had dried up and blown away overnight, and everything left in its place is just death and ugliness. Um, and then. Again, that, that sounds like drama, but I think there's pictures that show that's really what's left behind at a, after a wildfire is just destruction. What a powerful image. Uh, we have a photo here of the back part of your land before the fire. Yeah, I called it the Shire. Mm. And then describe this picture for us. Um, that's probably a week after the fire. Um, so that whole area under that big tree, you couldn't even see into the woods because it was so lush. Um, and now you could see kind of all the way into the woods because so much got burned away. Um, those huge trees are, are dead. Um, just because they're still standing doesn't mean they're not dead. Um, uh, all of the big trees. So we had maybe six of that size tree around our property and um, they're all dead now. Uh, that's my family standing where our house would have been, um, or ha where our house was. After, uh, after a fire, you know, there's just rubble, and they have to scrape away the rubble. Um, so this was after FEMA had scraped away what was left of our house. Mm. Um, so that's kind of us where our front door would have been. Wow. I know it has to be incredibly hard to endure this kind of a loss, and you know, in your writing, you speak so lovingly about nature and the, the good it does for your soul. Um, you know, you, you talk about you can have this, like, terrible day at work and then come home and you're on the lake looking at bald eagles by 530. Yeah. And yeah. just, like, what that does for a person. Um, and yet this tragedy, to be robbed of your home, of the parks around your home, was itself caused by nature. How have you grappled uh, with nature being both your refuge and also this wild, dangerous thing that took your home? Yeah, it's humbling. Um, it it gets me back to to a place of realizing that I'm very small um, in relation to nature. Um, it it reminds me that um, I'm. I'm not just a consumer of it, um, and that it's a relationship. Um, it's, I think, uh, at least growing up, um, nature was like a beautiful giant arrow that pointed to God, and we were like, look, it's beautiful, God made it, yay, and like, move on. Um, but I've, I've come to be in more of a, of a relationship with it the same way I'm in a relationship, you know, with my husband or with you or with any of you um, in that it can be very difficult. Um, there are days where it doesn't go well. Um, there are times where I take more than I give with nature. It's almost always. Um, and then, but there are times where nature isn't, isn't terribly loving or easy to be around. Um, 
especially right now, uh, Reading, not just my property, but the, the parks and the lakes and the mountains around it, um, they look like um, they look like they're sick. Um, so if you've ever been close to someone who is maybe going through chemo, you know there's a certain look, and it's hard to be around someone who looks and is ill and not well, um, and your instinct is to look away and to move away. Um, but you know that's that's not what's needed. What's needed is to move toward it, even when it's not easy or beautiful. You mentioned um, that poetry kind of played a role in um, how you processed some of this loss afterward. Do you want to tell us about this poem? Yeah, I had discovered it earlier, um, but it's a poem by Wendell Berry called The Peace of the Wild Things. Um, and it's just an expression of um, when everything is going wrong and you, you can't square up uh, with the, the world you're living in and the society you're living in, um, you can go to nature and sit and observe and watch how nature does things. Um, and nature is, is, almost always, is almost always balanced and right, um, even when it's kind of cruel and crazy. Um, and so um, well it was a poem I would read often when I was troubled and I am before the fire and then after the fire. Um, it's been um, more potent, I guess. Well, it's a few seconds long, so we're going to listen to the poem now, read by the author. The Peace of Wild Things When despair for the world grows in me And I wake in the night at the least sound In fear of what my life and my children's lives may be I go and lie down where the wood drake rests In his beauty on the water And the great heron feeds I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time I rest in the grace of the world and am free. So many of the wisest uh, voices in my own life uh, echo this sentiment about the restorative power of nature in our life. Um, and yet, you know, our scripture reading this morning, uh, among other things, uh, make me ask the question, do we re are we returning that favor? Mm. You know, are, are we being uh, stewards and restoring uh, this, this gift to us that is so restorative to us? Um, I wonder, what, what is your take on the concept of stewardship, and what does that mean to you in relationship to uh, spirituality and Christian faith? I think um, it's, it's easy for me to think of it as a parent. Um, I have a nine- and a seven-year-old, and if my child makes something and brings it to me um, and gives it to me, it's a drawing or or even if you know someone I love makes something and, and brings it and gives it to me as a gift, um, my response to that gift should um, should reflect my love for the person and my respect for the gift, whether it's a crayon drawing or a, a diamond ring or what have you. Um, and it would seem that if we are presented with um, the perfection that is creation and our response to it um, is to drain it uh, for ourselves and um, and be destructive to it in a way that um, starves and displaces our neighbors uh, that contradicts everything we've said about respecting God and respecting what he's capable of, he or she is capable of, and respecting what he created. So if I say I love you and I say I love God and then I, then I take creation and I don't treat it 
um, with even half the love or respect it deserves, I, th I think it's hypocritical. Um, and I think we're, I think, you know, we were presented with creation because we were designed to be in long-term direct contact with it. Um, that doesn't mean we all go buy an acre with chickens. Um, it means we, we find the relationship um, between us and creation that, that speaks to us and speaks to our unique gifts. Um, and we live that in a way that anyone observing our lives and walks can't help but notice that nature and creation are integral to us. I love that you're doing that in your own life, um, in your vocation as a writer, that your love for creation comes through in those ways, you know. Uh, and y your response to this wasn't that you had to go join the fire service <laughs> and quit your job. Uh, that you're finding a way as a writer um, to highlight this, to, to draw attention to the beauty of creation. I think that's something that um, you know each of us are able to do in whatever vocation or calling. Um, I want to, I want to before we go, uh, share a piece that Callie wrote um, that a filmmaker turned into um, a short film. So this is about uh, Trinidad Grove, is that right? Uh, yeah, I th it's somewhere in Trinidad County, which is the far northern coastal part of California, Humboldt County. Um, it's also called the Lost Coast. Um, it's basically kind of rainforesty, and um, parts of one of the Star Wars movies were filmed there, like when the Ewoks are flying through the thing All in right. the jungle. Fun fact. Well, let's watch <laughs> this short film. A very long time ago, there were no groves, because everywhere was a grove, with no roads to bisect, and no people to erect stones and fences and bridges. The trees were very, very young and had much living ahead of them. The enormity of their lifespan loomed in woolly mists around them. So they stretched out their root fingers and wrapped them around each other's, intertwining and holding very tight. The ferns found pockets of root fingers where they could nestle in, and the moss stretched itself out over the soil, and everything became very soft. The trees grew and made patterns of light and dark on the ground, and the vines swirled in to trace the patterns. Spotted spiders moved back and forth and up and down, making nets to catch the mist, and the mist would linger on the nets in drops that cupped the light. was very quiet all the time because the trees needed to focus on their lives. It is not easy to grow so much for so long. Some trees became tired and lay down on the soft ground. Others leaned and rested their tops on one another. And when one tree had to stop, another would grow out of it and reach very high into the gray and gold sky. Growing is forever, they whispered. Callie, thanks so much uh, for sharing your story. I know as you continue uh, the long road of rebuilding ahead that uh, our prayers will be with you. Would, you. would you help me thank Callie for sharing her story?
Go in peace.